Good morning. Welcome to Ag Talking Raw, where I talk raw about agriculture and other things that are on my mind. Okay, so it's been a actually it's been about a week since I actually made one of these. Uh, it has it been a week? January thirteenth. It's now the nineteenth. So a few days. Uh, anyway, been busy as busy can get. You know, just uh, trying to make hay in the winter, which is a pain in the ass. Uh, you never know when you're going to break through the uh, frozen ground you never know when you're gonna hit a warm spring which I live on Spring Hill Road in in Frenchtown New Jersey so or in Kingwood New Jersey but Frenchtown is our mailing address because that's where our post office is uh, but anyhow uh, Spring Hill Road is it's, there's springs there and all around my surrounding area and they generally do come up from pretty deep I guess uh, because they're warm not that you're gonna you know, they're not volcanic warm, but they're warm enough that they don't freeze. So they come up from deep enough below that they, they're they warm enough that they don't freeze at all around them. So you sink in. So you're constantly wondering when you're going to break through the ice and, you know, or this, the frozen ground. And uh, we haven't had a super cold uh, winter so far. So we've been working on thin, thin uh, mud and, uh, you know water frozen frozen mud uh, which becomes rather nerve-wracking because when the tractor doesn't sink it it can possibly what the hell that was when the tractor doesn't sink and the baler does what will happen is you'll actually spin out on the frozen ice and mud so you kind of got to be going at a pretty good clip of speed to do this uh, as correctly as you want to call it because you know making hay in the winter is not correct anyhow uh, but it is what it is and it's what I have to do now I, I did have some comments on or questions about you know what the yield was like on that hay well it's down obviously uh, anything after the middle of October it starts to deteriorate and we did have snow in the middle of november this year so that kind of screwed things up it's about eight inches of snow which matted it down took it right to the ground uh once it goes to the ground then it makes contact with the ground and it starts to rot uh, the other thing is deer we have an extraordinarily large amount of deer uh, a very large deer herd here in New Jersey that is out of control and they're looking for anything green and so they're walking all over this thing then believe it or not they will mash a whole entire field to the ground so you got that to deal with uh, deer and mice now what happens with the mice is they're underneath it and they're chewing on it eating it making nests out of it going for the seed they're just they're taking it away so it's been going on for since the middle of October that the mice and the deer have been uh, depleting the, the hay crop. And they've got about a half of it in some areas and other areas, maybe only a quarter. Um, but and there was actually one farm that we did doesn't look like they touched it at all. I mean, I was stomping out bales like there was no tomorrow. Uh, made close to 900 bales or did I make 900 bales? No, not quite 900 bales. I was about 30 bales short of 900, 30, 35, 40 bales short of 900 in two and a half days of bailing yes two and a half days of bailing see i teresa is not on the hay rake anymore because william is too small to be bouncing around in the cab um i'm thinking the next go around that i'm going to put him in the cab with me in uh in the baler and she can run the hay rake while joe Joe, Tim, and Dad, or Joe, Tim, and Cody can run the mowers in front of me. So if I can get three mowers rolling, I do have four. I know Jeremy Lee was uh, asking his, you know, he had his girl ex-girlfriend call me or send me a text message. It wasn't call me, but sent me a text message asking me, and I don't know why he couldn't do it, but asking me why I wasn't using the three-point mounted uh, disc mower. Well, the, the answer to that is it is incredibly slow to deal with that because you're only going a hydro swing. You can go swing it from side to side, go down the field, turn around, come right back down. Same thing with the self propelled. Uh, you got a 12. I got a 12 foot hydro swing and I've got two. I guess you would call them 15 foot self propelled a case and a John Deere. OK, so the other night uh, we were working, uh, had a really productive day, 368 bales on that day. The time before that, we had done 390, we did 398 
so I haven't quite hit the 400 in a day. And then the half a day that I did day before last, or night before last, before the snow hit us, uh, I made 100 and 116 bales. And it wasn't even half a day. It was in, it was just a few, couple, three hours at night. Um, chased down some, well, I guess we did get started about 2 o'clock. I had some work that needed to be done to the baler. And uh, they were running the, the mowers very, very slow. Because, the like I said, the hay is getting matted down pretty tight to the ground. Uh, I'm going to try and I'm gonna try and come up with a, a, uh, a knife that is more... Uh, aggressive that actually sucks the stuff up off the ground they for the case they do make this concaved they call it a rock blade i don't know why they would call it a rock blade anytime i ever put those on they they seem to you know bend into the cutter bar making a mess and they never really lasted and they're expensive but you know hey what are you gonna do uh the john deere you can get a seven degree or an 11 degree uh, blade. I usually use the, the straighter 7 degree blade because of stones and rocks. Because if you have that 11 degree pitch, I think it's 14 maybe. 7 and 14 degree. I need the 14 degrees. I usually run the 7s. So uh, what that'll do is it'll actually bring, you know, it'll, it tilts down more actually pulling air and creating a vacuum actually sucking it off the ground so i'm going to change the blades on the john deere to the 14 degree if i could get a 23 degree that'd be even better but or 20 degree but i don't know i gotta talk to deer and see what their thoughts and ideas are uh i may design my own blade yes i may design my own blade uh, i'm a pretty good welder and all i really need to do is actually you know, if I've got a seven degree blade and then I add a little bit of a ramp to that blade with a stopper so that when it does hit an obstruction, it won't flip completely behind. But just a little wing to pull. I don't know if that'll work or not. That's just my engineering ideas. You know, will it work? Will it not work? Um, you know, to suck that hay off the ground. I know it takes a lot more power. <coughs> it becomes dangerous at that point, too, because if one of those things flies off, it could potentially fly off and kill somebody like a bullet. Um, but those are the, those are the things that I'm having, you know, the, 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 the problems that I'm trying to overcome. Uh, for the most part, the only thing that is being left behind is what is plastered to the ground that I can't get cut. Um, even the green, you know, the, the stuff that was living before at frost or at the frozen time when it froze, uh, that stuff is like leafy, real leafy material. And it's actually worked its way down, and it's kind of made a swirl. It's weird how it goes, because it'll swirl around the, the original dead standing stuff, or the stuff that's dead uh, and laid over, and the, even the rake will pull it up, but I can't cut it. Now, I did on the, there was a runway that I did, they, uh, uh, yeah, an airplane runway. I do a couple of those, actually, it's kind of strange, but yes, yeah, old grass strips, and, uh, the, uh, uh, yeah, old grass strips. Anyway, the, the, uh, it, when it swirls, it, it really gets tight to the ground and I can't cut it. And if it was the dead standing stuff, like the first cut that died back and then a the second cut came through, which even, you know, it was first cut anyway, but, uh, this first cut that was, that was dead standing, the rake will actually pull that off the ground and you'll get it. Um, but the second cut or the second growth or new growth or the leafy growth that you would have in that grass hay, it is impossible to get it. The rake won't tear it off the, off the plant because it's still got enough uh, living tissue to it that it isn't going to let it loose. So on the runway, Joseph had raked it off, raked it up the runway, and that actually fluffed up the grass enough. I just went down the, down the windrow with the, uh, with the mower and actually cut it right down I and mean, it worked pretty good I didn't do the whole thing I just did a, a small test plot or pass to see uh, what it would be and we were under time constraints so I let it go what's the worst that's going to happen it you know what's the worst that's going to happen it rots rots down creating a fertilizer and some organic matter <gasps> excuse me a little indigestion here I drank that coffee this morning without any food and we were supposed to get some nasty weather last night that I'm looking out the window right now and it looks like if we don't get that nasty weather, I'll be back in the field in a couple of days. So 
Uh, the next thing that we I ended up having problems with was actually with the Crown Baylor. Two things. One is I hit a frozen clump of dirt or a groundhog hole that had froze, and it actually bent my uh, guards where the pickup tines come through, the steel bands. And I always like the plastic ones, but Crone, nobody makes them for a Crone. I would love to just go get the poly ones for the Crone and be done with it. But they don't make them. <coughs> I think there's a reason they don't make them, but I don't know. Maybe they don't sell enough Crone balers. I would love to have the poly fi uh, finger guards or pick up finger guards, yeah. Uh, but they don't make them, so I don't know. May West uh, Corporation may be... Uh, working on them, I don't know, but there's no other company that that makes the poly bands, as far as I know. I think it was May West, and there was another there was another private company that was making them for the big the big three, you know, Case, New Holland, Heston, Massey Ferguson, those those style balers, um, John Deere Coon or the Coon Deer, as I call it. Uh, that is again uh, just they don't. I don't think they make them for that. Uh, but anyway. I'll just deal with the steel ones. <sighs> when you bend those, they actually bend egg-shaped. So what you do, what you do to straighten those out on the machine is you just take, you lift up the roller wind guard, which is a, oh, Crone has a very good pickup system, a very, very good pickup system. But when you break those tines, it is a, it is a bastard to get those pickup tines changed. You have to take out every other, I make the boys take them all out, but you take out every other uh, band, the one that's in front of the broken pickup tines, and then it's just a real bastard because that roller wind guard is there, and then over top of that is the deflector. So you have to have a deflector because they're camless pickups on the Chrome. I love them. I love them like no other. I've run Crone and obviously the Heston I ran with the pickup tines. I broke pickup tines on that Crone. We made 1,100 bales with that Crone or that Heston baler. And I broke pickup tines on it and then I replaced them all. All of them. I had extras. Brand new pickup tines, I broke them or Timothy broke them. They're a really long one. So I don't know. They're, I'd rather have the shorter ones that spin faster than the long ones that go slower. Uh, the, the whole idea is to get the material to the back of the, uh, into the pre-charge or the VLF or whatever VFR or whatever the hell Crone calls it. And, uh, Heston calls it a pre-charge chamber or stuffer chamber, uh, packer chamber, the packer fingers grab it. But with a canvas pickup, that hay is coming up or materials coming up so fast because that thing runs like 30% faster than the fastest competition. So even Heston's new UDX uh, pickup system does not run nearly as fast as what the Crone does. And for good reason, it's a cam. So you've got all these moving parts and they'll rattle themselves apart, whereas the Crone is just a rotor. And it takes speed to throw it off of those fingers. I have less problems with hay going, getting pinched in the Crone baler than I did on any cammed pickup I've ever used, even little baler, big baler, just because those things come up and then they stop and then they just cut the cam brings them down straight as it goes back. So the faster you make that go, of course, then it starts doing this in there and it causes problems. So I'm glad I have the rotor, but there has to be a deflector at the top to keep it engaged into the fingers until it gets up past there where I can chuck it to the back of where the the uh, precharge or that big reel, that VF, I, think, I want to call that VFS, variable flow system or some shit, very VRF, VFR, I, I can't ever remember the, the, the name of it. And I have the book downstairs, but anyway, it has to hit that deflector so that it doesn't fly forward. They've got that system perfect, but that creates a very tight area to work in. So if you're going to change pickup tines in a crone, my thoughts are you might as well change them all all at once because if you, and it's kind of expensive to do that because these things are like seven bucks a piece and it takes 120 of them. So it's, it's a lot of money. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's a lot of money. Uh, I bought a hundred of them just recently and fuck, I don't even know what the, I don't even know what the bill was. It's just, they didn't even tell me just here. 
So I know I bought $1,200 in knife arms. That's the second problem. Uh, this baler, and you'll probably see it on the One Lonely Farmer channel because I do have some footage of what I was doing. Uh, everything wears, okay? So as things wear, you need to make adjustments. Uh, and that's just the long and the short of it. Pickup times, ooh, my light went out. Uh, Pickup times wear, so you actually, as they wear down, and some of them, because they're just touching that ground, at that high rate of a speed, they'll wear right. They'll wear right down. You'll see a half inch off of them. Uh, the ones that are uh, towards the center of the uh, the pickup. The ones at the ends, out on the ends, are the ones that break off most of the time, because I don't know. There's more. It has to throw it into that auger system, and I think it it actually pulls on it. And then if you hit that, eh, whatever. It just there's certain areas on every pickup that they that they uh, break off in more than others. But I've learned over time that it's just better to, if you start breaking pickup times, just change them all. Just change them all. Throw them all away because they become fatigued and that that's it. But if you want to straighten out, I know I'm getting bouncing all over the place here, but if you want to straighten out the pickup, uh, the bands in the, your steel bands, you know you've hit a groundhog hole and you can see that they're that it's bent upwards, don't go to the top and bend it down because you can't. In a crone, you can't do it. New Holland, you can do it, and Heston, you can do it. But or Massey Ferguson, Heston, Agco, Agco Balers, uh, you can do it from the top down because there's plenty of room in there. But the crone is is a little bit of a bastard. So what you got to do is you, you chain up the you chain up that roller wind guard, which takes the deflector uh, up out of the way too. And then you go with a sludge hammer and you just bang each one of them, push it back. So it has to expand it so if you hit a groundhog hole it'll bend the the hoop forward so it becomes an egg so right on the leading edge of it you just bang 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 all the way down there's like 40 of these things i don't know how many there are there's at least there's a bunch of them so you just bang those things forward and then that actually expands them at the top and the bottom reforming them the, to the right uh, length or the right dimensions and you're good to go I had the ones out the other day and they were bent kind of messed up and I had a I have a brand new one that I used as a model or a yeah just a model and I have a pound and a half uh, handheld a one pound hammer and I just banged it in the middle on a, on a piece of con on the concrete and that actually put it back into shape don't do this once you take them out and you bend them like this, this is a that creates a gap, and you have to put those cap screws in the top and the bottom in order to get those to <laughs> to bolt them back on. So if you just say, "Oh well, I'm just going to bend this back to where it is," you pull it out like that. You match your old one, even though it's a little higher in the center. Now you've got it matched at the bottom. When you bolt those bitches on, when you bolt it, go to bolt those on. You always put the two in the bottom first. Think about this now. Put the two in the bottom first. Don't tighten them. Just get them in there, threaded, three or four or five threads, just so that that much of the bolt's sticking out. Go to the top, and then gravity can do its work. So you, you push down. I use the impact gun, push down on it, and get them started and go from there. Then tighten the top ones, then go back down to the bottom ones. But it's kind of tough. But in order to change all the, the pickup tines and that, you have to remove the roller wind guard and that deflector or you need to become an acrobat. So I did it the hard way the other day. I needed, there was one area, it was about a foot wide. It was four pickup tines wide. There was one pickup tine on one, one uh, rail in the rotor, in that pickup rotor. So I could see that I was missing hay. Uh, it spins so fast that it does grab it, but it would dribble off the sides. Well, one pickup tine uh, and then there was a couple off to the sides of it that only had a single uh, a single tine on the double tine. So there was this huge gap, and it was allowing the hay to go underneath the baler, causing a mess. You know, lost money. I mean, it's lost money. No matter what you do, it's lost money. Even if those pickup tines cost you $5,000, the hay that you would lose in a day's time far outweighs uh, the, the money that you've spent uh, putting the tines in or the time that you spent. So that half a day that I wasn't bailing, I was maintaining the baler. So problem two. All right. So when you, when I bought my crone baler, I didn't even know what the top side of that baler looked like. I mean, I went to the field and I bailed hay. I never even, 
I was listening to books on tape. And I was listening to books on tape here the other day, too. I made the adjustments on the knotter. Like I said, there's wear that happens. And I was you know, the night before I was having problems with it. So I, I, I know that the little ball on the end of the knife arm, they wear. Even if it wears a 64th of an inch, it doesn't sound like much. But you got to take that into consideration that it's a 64th of an inch on the top and the bottom side. You've got a 32nd of an inch of wear. A 32nd of an inch of wear, way out here at the other end of that knife arm, isn't allowing that knife arm to pull the knot through, the tails through that knot off the bill hook. So when that knot or knife arm comes by and it starts to strip the twine off of that bill hook, it cuts and strips at the same time and there's a little tail on that knife arm that actually pulls that string way out past that that bill hook to strip it off the bill hook. Well I was having problems with the knots hanging so I didn't have a book handy and I'm like god I know what's wrong with this thing I just don't know what the fix is and even though I'm very well versed in knotters, and I know 99% of the problems with knotters. Actually, I know all the problems with knotters. It's just there's symptoms, small little symptoms that can be one or the other or both. So you adjust one and then the other, it's like, God, it, it will make it better, but it doesn't make it perfect. So I went ahead and I have... A spare ball for the knife arms and I had a spare knife arm okay so and there's there's three three let's see how many replaceable parts are on that there's four replaceable parts in it the arm itself the ball the knife and the strip the knife stopper where that twine gets in there where the knife it's like a scissoring action the shaft the, the knife the shaft the ball the arm and then there's that little metal bar okay one of those knotters I broke a knife arm on just broke it I never ever in I never since I broke that knife arm have touched that knotter so I know that that knife arm was worn now I know there's a lot of people out there say I never replace a knife arm I only replace the the knife or I just you know I just never touch them these, knot, these knotters have made 64 plus thousand knots. Very quickly, it makes two knots every bale. Cha chink cha chink. So as the needles go up, it makes a knot. Then the needles come down, past the knotter, tucker fingers come back, slam that thing into the twine disc, and it makes another knot all in one stroke. So one needle stroke comes up, cha chunk, comes down, cha chunk, you got a bale. And the start of a new bale. So, very quickly, blink of an eye, it's done. I mean, one stroke of the plunger. That thing strokes at 45 strokes a minute. 45 strokes a minute. That's almost a stroke every second. It's like a stroke every 1.2 seconds. That's how fast that sucker's going. So it's ch chunk ch chunk And speed creates friction, friction, wear, and you have these problems. So... I found my books. So yesterday I was looking for the books, couldn't find the books. Found the books. I thought I had them here at the house. Teresa's like, I don't remember seeing those books. I'm like, yeah, I had them here. I had them under the desk here. What happened to them? Well, last year when I ran into that stump with the rotor or the pickup on that baler, I took them to the farm and I have a spot in the toolbox where they are. And I thought to myself, self, you put those things in there. And I went over and sure enough, there they were. Uh, okay. So it has all the adjustments in the book that you're supposed to make in algebra. X equals seven, 70 million, millimeters. I don't do algebra. I never could do it in school. I probably can do it in my head, but I don't get the concept of it. I just don't care about it. So anyways, it's in algebra, and it's like, can you please do layman terms? But they have this awesome thing here. Okay? So you input... You input this and that, and that equals the other thing, you know, and that's, that's what I did. So the gaps, 
I have this awesome pattern sitting down in the other building. It's called a brand new Crone Big Pack 1290 HDP. So I went down there and I looked and I felt and I, I realized that there were three things, three things that I was doing. I wasn't doing incorrectly. I just didn't have them quite right. The first thing that I adjusted was the twine discs. Okay, so a lot of guys never even touch a twine disc because they don't do enough hay to uh, deem a twine disc worn enough to mess with. Or they call the dealership up, the dealership up, and they come out and they like, "Oh yeah, well, we're going to do some work to your knotters because they're out of adjustment." <coughs> you go on about your day feeding cattle, moving grain, whatever you do, pushing snow, God knows what, moving hay, and the 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 technician that came out to do the work on a baler, he knows everything about the fucking things. I mean, if he doesn't know, he makes a phone call to the guy that does know, and then he walks him through it, and boom, you're you go to the field and you're like, whoa, I could bail all day and never get off the tractor seat. Well, okay, so I had adjusted the twine discs. I went down to the new baler. I adjusted them. I knew there was wear on them, so I adjusted them to where I thought they should be. I go down to the baler, the new baler, and lo and behold, I adjusted them correctly. The other problem was uh, the knives. Knives get dull. They don't cut. When they delay in the cut, that delays the timing. And that's part of the reason why it wasn't stripping the knot off, because it was like, ee! It's like an old lady chewing on a steak without putting her teeth in, you know, that kind of thing. So they were dull. I had sharpened them up, and that alleviated a lot of the problems, but it didn't alleviate them all. So I had put new bill hooks on, new tong tongues on the bill hook. They're like $85 a piece. These things are friggin' expensive. Take six of them. It's like 400 and some odd dollars in these things. And it's like, okay, uh, I just replaced those. What could possibly be wrong with those? I tensioned them too tight. So when you tension them too tight, there's not enough give when it's stripping it off. It's stripping it off, and they hang on that on that hook. So if you're going along and your flags are not bouncing, all right, it makes a knot, they should all just go ka-ching. Well, in the Crohn's case, they come down. In the New Holland and the Heston Agcos, they come up. So in a Crohn's case, they come down, and then they come up. They don't go up and then come down like the New Holland and the Case and the Deer and all that. Well, actually, the John Deere doesn't even have flags. They did away with that. It's all done computer controlled. And I don't know. It tells you when, you know, through the computer there's a broken knot. The Crone only tells you if there's a broken lower knot. It doesn't tell you if there's a broken upper knot, which is something I think they need to do something about because that's when you start breaking the tongues on your bill hooks. Because if, you, if you're not looking back every time, which you don't do when they're running correctly. 99% uh, of the time, you break the upper string, not the lower string. And the lower string will continue to feed up and down without any problems, even with a broken bill hook. And then it doesn't trip the sensor. So Crone has to do something about that. Um, uh, that's just my opinion, uh, that whether they do it or not. There is a new baler design coming out, and I'm told that it is going to be second to none, the best ever built. Uh, and it will... It, they're miles ahead of anybody else anyway, but they're going to fix a lot of the wear issues and some of the other things that are weak on the system. <coughs> the pickup drive system, when it slips, it makes a hellish noise. So they're changing that. They're cha From what I understand, they're changing it. I'm not going to give away my secrets because the secrets are crone because I know that the other companies are looking at them pretty hard trying to catch up. They're not trying to pass them. They're just trying to catch up because they're nowhere as close. Uh, yes, I love my Crone Baler. I haven't tried the new one yet, but when I get the new one out, then it's going to be I love my Crone Balers. So anyways, I readjusted the tension on the bill hook tongue. There's a little uh, cam follower. So as that thing comes around, now the Crone has a replaceable cam follower. I had one in a toolbox. So... I could see that there was quite a bit of wear, which will delay the opening of the tongue. So I replaced it. And it was in, I replaced it on one that was acting really stupid. The tongues have flat spots in them now, the roller does, because I over tensioned them. Stupid on my part. So, anyhow, I'm going to replace them again. 
Yes, again, as stupid as that may sound. So anyway, I put the new knife arms in. I got new blades. I just did the complete thing. They're almost $200 a piece. Yes, $200 a piece. Uh, there's six of them, so that's 1200 bucks for those stupid things. And I know there's people probably saying, oh, you're crazy. You spend money like you change your underwear. But if you want to get in the cab and be productive, you cannot be getting out of the cab and fucking around with knotters and knots and things like that. And that's what's been plaguing me. The last couple of months of bailing, uh, it started mid July, you know, middle of the year. It's like, what is going on with this thing? I replaced the rollers and the needles. That alleviated problems. It, every little thing that you do to replace old and worn parts will help for a while, and then the next worn part begins a new symptom. So, I just said, forget it. I'm going to fix this thing correctly. I'm going to change the knife arms. I'm going to change those tongues again. I'm going to change those cam follower, the guides on the or the cam follower, not the guide, uh, that opens the wheel, and then it comes or opens the tongue, that comes around, and then it gets into that spring-loaded cam follower, uh, and that those were too tight. That's what caused the wear on the, on the tongue, so I'm going to have to replace those. Anyway, I do have them as spares in my toolkit, so I should be okay with those. I bought 12 when I did it the last time because I just didn't want to... I don't like repairing... Uh, or running out of parts when I need to go. So that's that's what I did. Uh, anyway, so the baler's running okay. It's, well, it's going to run okay. I don't know. I haven't... I got snow and rain and snot and shit and salt on the roads, you know? You ever wonder about having salt on your baler? <laughs> yeah, right? Oh, my God. So anyway, I guess that's just what I'm talking about here today. Uh, I did get close to 900 bales bailed. I think I said that already. And uh, I think I'm going to touch on some of these uh, some of these comments now. I don't know. A couple of them, they're, they're just not even worth reading. You know, I went through this. Yeah, I mean, we've got people that are... Uh, just asinine. So build the wall is what I said last time on my uh, live stream, or not live stream, but on this channel. That was the title, was build the wall. I still stand by that, even though, you know, Trump is a big pile of shit by this guy. He's telling me Trump's a big pile of shit. Hey, all politicians are a big pile of shit, okay? Uh, most of them, their first term, they're okay, <laughs> with the exception of Obama. Uh, he was not okay. Uh, I, he wasn't okay, and I don't care if you don't agree with me. Uh, yeah, uh, that's okay because you know what? This is America, and we have free uh, freedom of choice. And that was my choice was not to not to agree with the policies of the former president Barack Obama or Barry Obama. Uh, but I do kind of like uh, some of Trump's policies. I think the wall should have been built the first priority. Um, border security. We have five caravans coming up across Mexico. This left-wing nut job that's in Mexico that is allowing them to enter their country to come directly to the United States. Um, uh, there should be, you know, there should be uh, some consequences uh, that he has to pay uh, from our country because he's allowing them into his country with the sole purpose of getting through his country to come to our country, and then they amass at. Uh, they don't even amass at border crossings. They go to where there is no border crossing, no border fence or barrier or wall, whatever you want to call it. They, they, they just go there. Uh, they get through it, and then they're into our systems because they know the system. They have friends here. They do. They have friends here that have been in the system. There are whole industries that revolve around not having a border wall. There are teams and teams of lawyers. They're called immigration lawyers, and they are not there for the the willing uh, legal immigrant, the one that actually does what uh, uh, someone that is wants to be legal coming into the country. Um, I married an immigrant, uh, Miss Teresa. She resides behind those walls right now. She's there taking care of William. And uh, she, she came here legally. And it pisses her off to no end that these people can just cross the border and be in the country. And then they have lawyers that will fight for their rights. I'm sorry, if you're an illegal alien, you have no rights in this country. You need to be boxed up, shipped back, and sent to the country that you came from. The amazing thing is that I watched the news a little bit last night before I became so aggravated about it. Um, these people are well-dressed, as well-dressed as you can be. They look like me. They're in workwear. They're not in 
suits and ties, but they're they're dressed enough. They're not in rags. They're not, you know, dirty like you would think. They're clean. They have clean clothing. They have smartphones. This is amazing to me. They're out there taking selfies at the border like, yay, it's me, we're here, we're in the United States of America, just on the other side of that wall. Yeah, give me a break. If you're poor and you're running away from your country because of uh, oppression, um, genocide, uh, anything like that, which isn't happening in Guatemala, it isn't, it isn't happening there. It isn't happening there. I actually know someone. My grandmother is still alive. She was, she, she damn near died, but she's still alive. And this really nice Honduran woman, Honduran? Guatemala. Guatemalan woman. Her name is Maricela. Maricela is a really nice person. She came from Guatemala legally. Uh, she is a nurse's aide. She takes, she watches my grandmother. She's fun to talk to. She's nice. Um, you learn a little bit about Guatemala and how it isn't as bad as they say it is. So here's a person that came from there. She made her way here legally. She's working here. She sends money home. And that's okay. Because she's part of our society. She pays taxes. She does, you know, not that I agree with taxes. I think there's other ways to, to deal with this thing. Tax, income taxes, property taxes, sales tax, and all that shit. 150 years ago, there was none of that stuff. And we were still a thriving economy 100 years ago. I think even... Um, I think the first tax was, the first income tax, I believe, was during the Civil War. And then after that, it was dropped and then reinstated in 19 God knows what, after the Depression. Or before the Depression, I don't even know when it was, but whatever. I'm not, I'm, I like history, but I'm not great at it. Um, but anyway, it's not as bad as they say it is. And these people are being allowed to come through Mexico to come to these borders. And then they find the open borders, they come in. Now, that person that is behind that door there was telling me about uh, what it takes to become an American citizen here or even to come into the United States uh, legally. You have to have HIV testing, STD testing, you have to have all kinds of disease testing before you even are considered. After that's completed, you have to have a, a means, someone to sponsor you, to take care of you, or a job, you know, so that all has to take place before they allow you in legally. These people, they crawl across the border. They got drug problems, alcohol problems. They've got no prospects on work. And then what? They come in here, they work for pennies. If they're fortunate enough to make it across without being inducted into the slave trade. And yes, when I say a slave trade, it is called human trafficking, and it happens every day at the border. If you're a pretty girl crossing that border and they pick you up, your ass is going to be in a whorehouse and you're going to fuck your way into the United States. And I'm going to put it that bluntly. Uh, I watched a documentary on uh, National Geographic. Now, National Geographic is really a good television program. It was a good magazine back in the day. I don't even think they publish that anymore, but it is on TV. And they were talking about how horrible the conditions for these people that are crossing the border. They get picked up by these coyotes, I guess they call them coyotes. And then, you know, hey, we'll help you across the border. They take You, you have to come up with like $2,500 in the country you're leaving, the coyote will get you up through Mexico and into the United States, and then will pass you on to another coyote where you have to come up with the rest of your $5,000 um, uh, uh, passage fee, okay? <coughs> so most of these people, they scrounge enough money to get here, but they don't have any money to get through. And if you're an old man or an old woman, and nobody comes to pick you up at the safe house, um, they drag, they rob you, they drag you back to the desert in Arizona or wherever it is they picked you up at, they drop you off with no food, no water, and no hope of surviving, and then they perish out there, okay, they die, they die, they, there are so many dead bodies out in these deserts, and that's another thing they don't want to talk about, uh, of course Nancy Pelosi isn't going to talk about it, dumb fuck Chuck Schumer, he isn't going to talk about it, about the dead people, that are left out there to die by the coyotes. I mean, they got to the safe house. Nobody came to pick them up. And boom, back to the desert, you get a death sentence. 
Okay, so that's happening. Now, if you're a pretty girl and you scrounged up enough money in, say, Guatemala or Honduras or wherever the hell you're coming from, and you make it to the United States, you're a real pretty girl. You don't only have to be super pretty, but you got to be young, you know, something like 18, 19, 20 years old, and you don't have money. Well, your pussy is worth money. So what do they do? They sell it. They tell you, okay, we need that $2,500, which you could probably do in a good couple of weeks. You know, they'll turn them out. Hey, 18-year-old virgin. God, people pay $10,000 for that pussy. You know, good-looking girl. Boom, you're out of here. They keep them there for years. National Geographic had, at gunpoint, their, their cameramen went into this safe house to interview. They were only allowed to ask certain questions. How long have you been here? Two years. Two years. This girl's been selling her pussy for two years for $2,500. How many hundred thousand dollars do you think that girl has made? And they just drag them out onto the street. The pimp is in the car around the corner. The girl goes off for 20 minutes or whatever it is. comes back, cleans up, off to the next one all night long for two years. And all she says is, I just want a, I just want a better life. I just want a better life. If you made $2,500 and you left... Your home in Honduras, you're clean, meaning you don't have any sexually transmitted diseases. You don't have any anything else. You have $2,500, and you want to come seek asylum in this country. $2,500 will get you into this country. Trust me. I know. I know what she paid. I know what it took her. She needed a sponsor. That's the problem, though. I mean, yeah, you could get married. That'll help. Or you could have a friend that is willing to say, hey, I make X number of dollars. I think you need to make like 20000 bucks. I make $20,000 a year. I'll sponsor you. And she can come up and she has to have some kind of gainfully, to be gainfully employed, which isn't really that hard in the United States of America because of minority acts. If you're a minority in the United States, you will um, be allowed to get a job above the majority. The majority would be the white male. Uh, the funny thing about this is, and a few years ago, I saw this on the news, that white people will be the minority minority in the United States by 20, it was like 2025. And then with when our economy, after Barry Obama took over, our economy failed. You know, everybody said it was Bush, but it was Obama. Uh, the economy failed 2008. Of course, it started with Bush, but it was carried through the eight years of Obama. And... You know, towards the end of his reign, it had started to come up and blah, 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 blah. You all know the history here. It's recent history, so you shouldn't have forgotten it by now. Uh, they had pushed it back to like 2030 something. That is within my lifetime. I will become a minority. So when white people become the minority in the United States of America, does that mean that we get first dibs and now all the, let's say, dark skin color or the minority groups in the United States have to say, oh, well, he's a minority now, so <laughs> we, we have to give him a job. Fuck the white man. You know, that kind of thing. You know, is that what's going to happen then? Uh, I don't know. It, it's it's kind of coming and it's going to come around. Wow, I've been talking for 40 minutes. So the wall is a necessity. It isn't a ne it's a necessity to keep the flow of foot traffic towards the ports of entry see the funny thing is when when they pick you up the the border patrol agents pick you up they track your ass down run you down in the desert handcuff you and drag you to a port of entry for processing back to your country that's when they cry asylum we want asylum and then they get it well i'm sorry if you didn't come through the port of entry crying asylum um, and you do have to be tested. That's what those cages are for, where they put you in. They separate you from your families. That wasn't started by Trump. That was that was actually, I believe, a Clinton thing, which carried through, and Obama expanded it. And there's video of him talking about it, in which nobody had a problem with it then. But now that the Trumpsters involved or in office, now it's just this horrible thing that you have to you have to uh, stop them from doing. You know, being separated from your family, yes, it's traumatizing. They're young kids, whatever. They got video games and it's air conditioned. They got a bed and warm clothes, clean clothes and food. So they should be pretty happy about it until their parents are processed. And then they decide whether they're going to allow this illegal son of a bitch to come into the country and suck off the tits of America or ship them back to the country that they came from where they know they can 
They know how to survive there. I'm sorry. Um, they know how to survive there. I've been to third world country. Philippines. I go there lots. And I see the people. They're happy. They survive. Do they want something better? Yes, because they think they want something better. When they get here, it's a different story. Uh, they realize that uh, the streets aren't paved with gold. And you actually do have to work really hard to get the money that you have. Uh, it is no different. So, but anyway. Ah... Uh, yeah, so I'm going to read a couple more of these things, and I'm going to let it go. Great topics discussed there, Wes. I thought Mexico was paying for the wall. Mexico is paying for the wall. Uh, Massey, Massey Man, MM, Massey MM. Mexico's paying for the wall. See, this is this is the thing that... All right, let's touch on something else. <sighs> Mexico's paying for the wall. They're paying for the wall in a roundabout way. It's called in the trade agreements. This NAFTA, free, trade agreements, free trade isn't free the what clinton signed into office wasn't into law was not or clinton signed into law was not free trade it was free for their shit to come to us but it cost us to send goods to them okay that's not free trade that's one-sided trade so what will a mexican buy that is 16 to 18 percent more expensive than what they're selling within their own country that protects their manufacturing, protects their jobs, doesn't protect our jobs. Our jobs are being, you know, deported into China and Mexico and Canada and wherever else they can do it cheaper. Um, yeah, so when you renegotiate a trade deal, that means that they actually have to pay for, you know, that there isn't free trade one way. It's free trade both ways or no trade at all kind of a thing. That's how the wall's being paid. It's through the uh, the VAT, or the dropping of the VAT, or the uh, or the mandatory uh, trade equal trade versus the trade deficit that we had. So Mexico sends a bunch of shit, or we send uh, our factories down to Mexico to build it to sell it back to us with no with no tax. Fat man in the office sitting in Beverly Hills, California. He makes lots of money because there's no VAT if we made it here to send it to Mexico. We send it to Mexico. They can sell it within Mexico with no VAT. They sell it for less, but not quite as less as what the VAT would be. And blah, 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 they make money. So we get that equaled out. Now there is no trade deficit coming from either one. If you sell us air conditioners, you have to buy our grain. Or if you sell us grain, we have to sell you fuel or whatever it is. Whatever it is, get that thing. And that's what a trade deficit is. The huge trade deficit between the United States and China is China sending us all these goods for, say, say they're, say they're buying $10 trillion worth of goods or selling us $10 trillion worth of goods, but they're only buying $1 trillion worth of goods from us. Now, China isn't going to buy little plastic balloons that you buy at Wall Fart. They're going to be buying food, corn. Soybeans, wheat, barley, rice, rye, whatever they need to buy needs to go in there. So they're only buying $1 trillion worth of food, food goods or grain from the United States. So now there is a $9 trillion deficit. So it needs to do this. Either China needs to stop sending us $10 trillion worth of crap that they could sell at Walmart and purchase... Uh, four more trillion dollars worth of grain to get the deficit at zero. So there is no deficit. Five trillion dollars worth of crap, five trillion dollars worth of grain. Because China builds its own cars, China builds its own computers, China builds its own stuff. They don't need electronics, they don't need furniture, they don't need the little plastic whirly gigs that you buy for your children at Walmart. They don't need to buy greeting cards because I doubt they even sell them there. Probably all hand done. So what they need and what we have is grain, food for their hogs, food for their chicken, food for their beef. They like to eat and they have the money to purchase that food. So that's where the trade deficit needs to be equaled up. Um, fine. It, and what has been happening is they've been buying soybeans and, and corn from Brazil, Argentina, and they don't sell whirly gigs and horse shit like that to Brazil and Argentina. So they're they're <laughs> they're buying four trillion dollars worth of grain and we're getting all that crap. So if we get rid of if we equal up this trade deficit and 
produce more stuff here in the United States that we don't have to buy from China, get China in check, get their pollution in check. Like, hey, dudes, if you keep polluting the air that's coming across the Pacific Ocean to us and polluting our atmosphere or air, we're not going to buy this crap from you anymore. We're going to produce it here in the United States, or we're going to fine you for that pollution by um, imposing a tariff until you get your shit together so that's how you kind of equal up the trade deficit and i'm sure there's a lot of people that are freaking out right now saying you don't understand how it works well no i actually understand perfectly how it works um and that's just it is that's how it works if if if, if you don't think that i'm correct do a little research and figure it out for yourself uh trade deficits generally they buy what they need not what they can produce themselves what they need is food uh, corn and soybeans. So when Donald Trump took office, uh, farmers across the United States lost money because, and this is bullshit, this is bullshit, because China says, you know what, if you're going to put a tariff against us, we're not going to buy corn and soybeans from you. We're going to buy from Brazil and Argentina. Well, Brazil and Argentina are big countries, but they're limited in what they can produce and sell. They can't sell $10 trillion worth of grain to Brazil or to China, to you know, to, to fill that order. So Brazil and Argentina have to buy it from the United States to send it to China. And of course, the middleman makes the money. So these trade, these uh, em embargoes or these tariffs and stuff, it's all bullshit. Uh, it does work to a point. Uh, the problem is that Brazil and Argentina are charging China more money for their grain than it's costing them to buy it from us. And it, it's not like the, the grain has to make a trip to Brazil and Argentina before it can go to China. It just leaves our ports just like it always did, goes to China. No big difference. And for $2 more, the Argentina or a dollar a bushel more, I was told that they were paying $14 a bushel for soybeans that they were purchasing here for $6 or $7. What the hell? And then to ship it over there, blah, God, it's crazy. It's crazy how that works. But uh, anyway, yeah, build the wall. Get these people funneled down to ports of entry like they're supposed, points of entry like they're supposed to come into. Let the Border Patrol agents take care of the, the ones that are allowed to come in and, you know, the true, the true uh, poor, not these. And here's another thing. More than 50. Less than 50% of the people coming to our borders, to cross our borders, are actually from Guatemala and Honduras. The, the rest of them come from Middle Eastern countries. They come from China. They come from India. They come from wherever it is they come from. They can go into Mexico, fly into Mexico on vacation. There's no big deal. And then they make their way across the border. Now, why are they doing that? Uh, they have a criminal record can't fly here directly maybe possibly uh they're bad people that we know are bad people and they don't want to be detected so we go to honduras guatemala or even directly into mexico to come across you know you can go to cancun mexico and wander out into mexico and work your way to our border cross at one of those broken down fences that i saw where there's a sign hey beware coyotes and rattlesnakes could kill you not bullets will kill you, which I got to be careful with because Instagram kicked me off of live streaming because I said we should go to the border and, you know, take care of business our, ourselves. They found that that was hate speech, which I find it to be American. <laughs> you know, let's stop these assholes. You know, if our government won't do it, who else is going to do it? Citizens citizens of the United States. Our government is to govern us, to govern and protect us. It's not here to control us and, and uh, to control us and uh, take our money. Um, they are there to protect us and govern us so that we don't get into too much trouble, you know, not rule us like a um, dictator. Uh, our government is now, and I'm not talking about the president, I'm talking about the whole thing. Uh, the whole entire House, Senate, President, they all have these different ideas, and it's actually just this huge fight between Democrats and Republicans, because our Republican president is not a politician until 2015 or 16 when he decided to run for the presidency. And when he did that, he became the enemy of both parties, because he is not part of the club. So, And that's why everybody hates him. 
I mean, not everybody hates them. That's why the media hates them, because the media is controlled by our politicians, our Democratic Party, our leftist or right-wing parties that are like, oh my God, Donald Trump, holy shit, we can't have that. You know, because there's a huge agenda that's happening, a huge agenda that they have, and they want that agenda the way they want it. And Donald Trump doesn't fit the agenda. So there you go. They must use algebra. Two negatives make a positive. Yeah, didn't I just talk about algebra? Huh. Anyway, uh, you realize that Putin has your president by the balls, and this is building, and this wall building is just a political ploy to change the conversation. <laughs> Where do you come up with that uh, Putin has our president by the balls? He doesn't. It's just, you know. <sighs> I love this. For your information, Soylent Green is people. That's correct. I actually rented the movie, and I watched it twice while I was bailing hay. This, the simple thing is, it's kind of funny. Um, you think artificial meat is bad? I read an article a few years back when the Japanese scientists are making recycled protein from human waste. Now, that is nasty. <laughs> yeah, eat a hamburger, recycle the shit, feed it back to us as a Soylent product. Oh, and I did see that uh, Soylent is sold on Amazon amazing i would stay away from that product but anyway southern green was the movie the charlton heston was in it pretty screwed up theme of movie pelosi has a wall around her mansion so she believes in only her private wall yeah that's correct and that's the thing they say that walls don't work i had a guy say that the berlin wall didn't work the berlin wall was very effective it was very effective the problem with that was the 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 problem with that was that you weren't allowed to come and go as you pleased. You know, the Berlin Wall needed to come down. So, yeah, Soylent Green. Love it. Anyways, it was a good movie. Watch Soylent Green. Anyway, 56 minutes in. I'm done. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you didn't, you can say, I didn't enjoy this one because you're politically fucked up. Or you can say, hey, I enjoyed that. That was great. Or you could just give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down. I'm okay with either one. And uh, I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.